2021 experience from, I guess, my angle, um, my experience with Georgie and the, the challenges that were involved and the background to it all and um, some reflections that we have um, on it going forward. So I thought I'd just start with a bit of a background um, to Georgie and I's relationship because she's probably one of the, the lesser known um, Australian athletes on the team and probably her selection um, was a bit of a surprise to many. So Georgie and I started um, working together at the, the start of 2018. Um, she'd come off a, a poor 2017-18, um, had a big battle with quadriceps tendinopathy that took a long time to settle. Um, sort of been the bit of story of Georgie's life. As a junior, she was um, she suffered from a lot of setbacks with injuries. Um, talented girl, made the, the world under 20s, um, but basically, again, was um, I was the team physio that year and, you know, she basically cross-trained away onto that team and throughout the whole um, five weeks that she was away, the majority of her training was, um, was done in the pool or on the bike. So... She's always had this um, background of, um, of injuries and had to, to really train around them. Um, never been a high volume trainer. Um, so when we um, uh, met up together, we basically our primary goal was to, to sort of, I guess, find a schedule that, that would work with her potentially longer term. Um, so we only worked on a five day running a week schedule with her, um, a lot of cross training involved. Um, and that first season we had together um, was probably the best in terms of, um, you know, the, the setbacks that she had. She basically had a clean season, um, improved a lot of performances on the, the flat distances and picked up a bronze medal at the, the national championships in the 3K steeple. But to be fair, it was quite a, a weak field that year. There wasn't a lot of depth um, and her actual performance was a little, little disappointing to us both. Um, the time wasn't, wasn't what we were expecting. Um, but I think that sort of was a, a bit of a turning point for her. She um, she realised she probably needed to be a little bit more professional in her um, preparation um, going forward. Um, and that then um, ultimately formed a bit of a, a springboard to her sort of having some some big jumps in her performance. Um, she had a bit of a break after that that nationals and, and came back to training with, you know, um, just, I guess, a, a new level of professionalism that I hadn't seen before. Um, that um, she was selected then to compete at the Oceania Games, and that's where she had a, a really big breakthrough. So um, she improved her PB by over 30 seconds, and that ultimately formed a, a big springboard to, to get her into the World Champs team in 2019 in Doha. Um, so um, she competed at the, 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 the Doha um, 2019 Champs, and then it was, um, after that, it had, been, it had been pretty tough tough going for us. So she had a little bit of a break, got back into training and then um, she ran the New South Wales 3K titles and um, ended up um, the next day had a bit of a sore knee, which turned into um, a chronic ITB syndrome. Took a lot of time to get right, finally got it right um, towards the end of the, that season and then COVID hit and the, the, the domestic season was cancelled. So never really got to, to get going for that season. Um, she was healthy then um, and motivated to then, I guess, try and um, start getting some consistent training back in in preparation for hope, hopefully a Tokyo selection um, and built back into training. And then in about June, um, so this is in um, 2021, um, uh, 2020, sorry, um, she started getting some foot pain and um, that turned into, again, some chronic um, plantar fasciopathy. Um, we had to have five weeks off from that. Um, got going again and then um, in December it was just the foot had started rearing its ugly head again um, she was just starting to compensate on it we had a scan there was a partial tear in a plantar fascia but she'd also developed some bone stress in one of the metatarsals um, from just um, compensating so this was um, in December and she was put into a boot for six weeks so I guess at this point the whole thought of you know, Tokyo being an even option for us was, um, was it was, I guess it was still a, in the back of our mind, but realistically I was thinking this is going to be tough. We're in December, we've got nationals in April, we're in a boot for six weeks. Um, we're not going to have a lot of time when we come out of it. And it's not necessarily, I guess, the the time missed, like six weeks. It's more the, 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 the rebuild that has to happen after that six weeks um, because Georgie's been in this chronic injury cycle before um, and we needed to really just not mess it up this time and, and make sure we did everything we could to at least get it to the start line. Um, 
so she came out of the boot um, in mid in mid January, and it wasn't really until sort of yeah mid to end of January she had her first jogging session. So the nationals are at the sort of mid April, um, and sort of we're getting towards the end of January, and we're just starting a return to running program. Anyway, we got through. Um, she got to nationals, basically cross trained away to the start line with some 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 running sessions in there, but. It, it, She'd shown a little bit of an improvement in form, but, you know, I was still wasn't very hopeful going into that, um, that national titles race. On the first water jump, she felt a sharp pain into her foot um, and finished the race. Um, not, not a great performance. I think she finished around about maybe seventh or eighth, um, only just snuck under 10 minutes. And we had an MRI scan following that a couple of days later and she'd ruptured her, her plantar fascia completely this time. So... Um, so this is now, I guess, mid-April. Um, Tokyo now seems even further away from being a possibility. And anyway, it actually ended up being that that was probably the best thing that could have happened for her. Um, so once she'd ruptured the plantar fascia, we consulted with the, the sports doctors. Um, and they were basically said to her, like, now that it's ruptured, you're really, you're not going to do any more damage and you're just going to be limited by, you know, how much swelling and bruising there is um, around the area. Um, so... They basically gave her a green light to say, okay, look, if you if you can handle the pain, you can start running again. So obviously there was a lot of bruising and swelling after the, the, the plantar fascia rupture, but in about a week's time, it had settled quite well. Um, and Georgie and I basically sat down then and, you know, we just talked about what she wanted to do and, you know, the pros and cons. And, and that's when the decision was to really just try and go all in. Um, and she didn't want to have any doubts um, going forward about, you know, at least she was going to give it a try and see how close she could get. Um, she was quite prepared to fail in that time and prepared to risk, you know, potentially something happening with her foot again. But it was the Olympics, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. You may as well have a have a go at it. Um, so in normal circumstances, you know, you'd probably never be advising an athlete to start back going into full training a week after they've ruptured their plantar fascia. But this was, um, I guess, unusual circumstances. So. Georgie started back training um, and we, the national run I think was um, April 18th and then um, the first of what we thought was going to be like, you know, the quasi Tokyo selection races um, was going to be um, on June the 4th. So we had about five weeks um, and that five weeks actually went um, pretty smoothly. Um, obviously there was a bit of foot discomfort but she was running a lot more comfortably than what she had um, in previous times. And um, I was actually quite really happy with, you know, the progression um, in her form. Um, we had to put in a lot of cross training. So it was like we obviously realised that she was a fair way down on what her fitness was um, and we had, to, we had to take some risks. Um, so there was a lot of training going on, not necessarily high running volumes, but a lot of cross training to supplement that. Um, so we got to the, the first race, um, which was on the Gold Coast, and... Um, I was actually reasonably confident going in. She'd had some good sort of key specific sessions um, that I thought that she she had really come on from her um, her select, uh, her nationals trials race. Um, but the Gold Coast race, for whatever reason, it didn't go well at all. She was only a couple of seconds quicker than what she'd done at nationals, and um, and we came away quite disappointed. She'd been well beaten by the girl um, by Cara, who'd finished second at the trials, and we sort of knew that. You know, realistically, um, with Jen and Amy Cashin sort of sewing up two places, it was it was going to come down to uh, one spot um, between herself, um, Paige, and and Cara. And Cara had clearly beaten Georgie at nationals um, and was the the better athlete at the time. Um, so that was a bit of a disappointment um, that race. And then there was two weeks um, to go until the the next the final sort of race, which was being in Townsville. Um, so again, I still was pretty hopeful because training it all, all looked good. And it was just sort of like, maybe she just needed a, a race to blow out the cobwebs. And then, um, she went to Townsville and it was sort of a bit of an all or nothing, um, race. Um, and Georgie's someone that just doesn't like to have people around her. She runs better when she's, you know, free flowing. She gets a little bit anxious, um, in a pack. And, um, so she just went for it, um, from the gun in Townsville and, and just missed a PB. She improved over 20 seconds from that, that previous run. So it was a really big step in the, the right direction. Um, 
it wasn't it still wasn't good enough to um to beat Cara. Um she was a couple of seconds ahead of her. So, you know, all it was still looking like, you know, Tokyo was unlikely at this point because um I think Cara's performance was enough to put her into that that top top roll down of 45 that were going to be selected for Tokyo. Um, so then it sort of seemed like we'd run out of races, um, but Georgie was sort of coming into form and pretty confident. So we spoke to um, the Bankstown Athletics Club who were um, happy to put on a, a meet for us. And that, so the Townsville meet was on the Friday, the, the following race was gonna be on the Thursday. So we had six days. So in all of this, there wasn't a lot of training going on. It was sort of like, I guess, train, sort of recover for the next race. And then especially now, um, with only six days, there's not obviously much that you're going to be doing in that time. So um, so we backed off again, um, just tried to freshen up for that race. And look, it had been amazing, perfect conditions all, all evening. Um, and Georgie's race came up. It started off in perfect conditions. Um, it was one of those races where it was just Georgie. Like, there was no one else that wanted to run the steeple. So I had to um, sort of get um, two girls from my group who have – have never run a steeplechase to basically just line up on the start line with her um, so that it would count as official if she ran well. Um, so they were climbing over the steeples while Georgie was trying to, to post a time. And um, the look, three laps in, um, she was on pace. Um, it was going really well. And then absolutely out of the blue, um, just sideways rain and wind for the last sort of four laps. It was just absolutely crazy. She only just missed a PB there, and it was by far her best run ever, but it was it was a disappointment because it was a missed opportunity, and it, it sort of seemingly Tokyo had, had finished then for us. Um, um, Matt Whitbread, who um, he said, um, look, he could probably put on one more meet for us, and it was sort of like, well, look, why not? You know, like, we're, we're either going to do it or, or you're not going. So... Um, it was, that was going to be five days later. Um, so again, so it's been, you know, this is now the fourth race in the space of sort of two and a half weeks. And um, again, just a race by herself um, and conditions were really good this night, but um, it was pretty evident um, early on in the race that all the racing, probably not having that background of training behind her, that it had just caught up with her and, um, and it was, it was it wasn't her best performance. It was still solid, but um, it was just like yeah, it it was just like yeah, we need we need a bit of time to recover and rebuild now, um, and that then sort of took us to the the roll down. So I guess Georgie and I and um, were very very invested in this roll down. Um, it um, it was really stressful time for us because essentially for those that didn't understand top 45 in the world go you either got the automatic qualifying time or you've got to be in the the top 45 and you can only take three from each country and this roll down system basically um, was being updated every few days um, and it um, at this stage um, uh, Cara was was in the in the roll down and. Um, We'd been researching results from overseas. We've been staying up late to watch obscure live streams from um, overseas countries, just looking to see if if people were going to push their chances for selection. Because basically, what we needed to happen was, you know, for other countries to run fast. Because Georgie was was well within the quota, and Cara was just just in it at this stage. And look, fortunately for us and really disappointingly for Cara, because she was the form athlete and, you know, if she'd stayed in the quota, she deserved her spot. Um, she came out of the roll down, um, which meant that, you know, Georgie was in um, along with Paige. And, you know, Georgie had run faster than Paige that season, had beaten her in the final thing. So we were reasonably confident that she was going to be selected at that point. Um, but there was no guarantees. And, and fortunately for us, um, she was selected. So it was a it was a really exciting time for both of us. But... Um, the reality in the next sort of couple of training sessions and stuff had been that, you know, all of this chasing racing um, times and selection times, she'd lost some conditioning. Um, and, you know, we only had sort of now like four or five weeks to go until Tokyo. Um, but it was pretty much here where um, anything that possibly could go wrong did go wrong in this final month. Um, so... One of the challenges was was now that she was selected. Um, we obviously realised it was going to be really hot in Tokyo, um, so we needed to to get some heat acclimatisation going. Um, so N Swiss were really good with that. Um, they provided the heat lab for Georgie, and we organised it that it was going to be on her her normal cross training day, um, which would would fall on a Wednesday. So um, 
Georgie went in there um, and I remember getting a phone call from Georgie sort of halfway through her bike session and this would just form the, the start of any phone call I received from Georgie I knew was going to be bad news. So um, she called me and um, told me that she was had developed some acute knee pain while on the bike and I just said, look, just quit it. There's no point, you know, getting sore or injured as a result of this. Um, we were able to get in to see a sports doc really quickly. Basically, she developed acute tenosynovitis of a quadriceps tendon, um, which meant that she needed to to just back off for a little bit um, and go on anti-inflammatories. So I guess from my perspective at this point, it's it's far from ideal. I've, I've realised, you know, that she's lost some conditioning. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time to prepare for Tokyo. Um, and obviously, we want to go over there and give the best showing of ourselves, but there's no point being injured. So we just had to to stick with what the sports doctor had suggested. She went on some anti-inflammatories for a few days um, and it and it seemed to, to clear things up pretty well. So we missed a, about well, maybe four or so days training. Um, and then, um, so seemingly on the next session, the knee, knee pulled up well. So it was sort of like, okay, crisis averted, we can just roll on from here. Um, after that though, um, I got a phone call so we'd done this training session, I think it was on the Thursday night. I got a phone call from Georgie's mum. Um, Georgie was now in hospital. Um, so she'd had a really bad reaction to the anti-inflammatories and she developed um, significant bleeding from the bowel. So uh, she was rushed to hospital and um, obviously we're in peak COVID times here and she doesn't want to um, subject herself to being in a, you know, a mass waiting room with people that have potentially got the virus and put her Olympic, um, her Olympics at, at risk. So um, her mum sent me, uh, sent me a photo. She was waiting outside in the freezing cold um, and she was tucked up in this little ball, just, um, you know, in this deep squatting position. Um, and she, she her mum said she'd been in that position for, you know, a couple of hours. Anyway, she was finally seen um and um she was discharged earlier that morning um we spoke the next day and georgie had said that um you know that she felt okay but because she'd been in this deep squatting position for a long time that she'd actually pulled up pretty stiff through both her heels um and i didn't think think much of it at the time we just sort of said yep i'm sure it'll just sort itself out so anyway we had to then allow the more recovery time and more mistraining time to try and recover from this hospital visit um, so at this stage, again, it's just, it's far from ideal. Um, I'm not panicking, but I, I'm concerned, very concerned um, that we're, we're running out of time to get the, the required training in. So anyway, we um, built back into things and um, started running. And, um, and the first session that we did together, Georgie was like, oh, I'm still feeling a bit of this stiffness from um, when I was there. And I was like, look, Georgie, I, please, I don't need any more bad news from you. Let's just, let's just see how it goes. Um, and anyway, um, she got through things fine and it, it warmed up and it was sort of like, okay, well, it's, it's a non, non thing. Um, and then the next day, um, Georgie had her scheduled long run, I believe. And again, 40 minutes into the long run. Well, I didn't know at the time, but her, her phone, um, number came through to my phone again. And I was like, oh God, like, I just knew that this was going to be bad news. Um, she said that she was 40 minutes into a run and that, the pain was just too much. She was starting to limp. And I was just like, look, just stop, leave it and just come over and I'll have a look at it. So rushed over to my place. Um, she came over and yep, she was limping. Um, she couldn't do a calf raise. Um, and I think, I believe this was July 19th. Um, and she was meant to be leaving, flying out to Tokyo on July 26th and competing on um, August 4th. So it's, it's very, very um, stressful at this time. Next day, rang around first thing Monday morning, got her in to see some sports doctors. Um, they were fantastic, just organised scans and stuff. And basically what had happened, and she developed um, acute inflammation in what's called her Kegas fat pad, which is this deep fat pad that lies deep to the Achilles. So basically it's a compression type injury from that sustained position that she'd been in and probably a, a, accumulation of all the steepling that she'd done and jumping off the steeples and landing heavily and then that just that compression position that she was in that night had probably just been enough to really to really irritate it so it was agreed that that would be um, injected with cortisone um, so that was done I believe Monday evening 
Um, and then it was, you know, she's meant to be flying out the following Monday. So, um, so we had to have downtime due to the cortisone injection. Um, and, and then she came, it was sort of said, look, give it three days and then you can start doing some running again. So she came to training. We just did some, you know, some light running and just some stuff to just give her a little bit of, um, just to see how it would feel at a bit of faster speeds. And we weren't to know at that time, but it had actually been understood that in later um, meetings with the team docs and stuff that possibly the injection hadn't been put into the right spot. Um, so there was still quite a bit of discomfort into the area. And um, basically then um, Georgie was just, uh, she was really, really, really upset. So um, I guess at this point it's now sort of, we've gone from thinking, okay, we want to perform the best we can in Tokyo to we just want to get to the start line. Like it was, it was a real reality that this this might not even happen now for her. Um, and she was pretty dejected. And and this was the Thursday night. And um, so I spoke to the sports doctors and the physios, and they were adamant that you know this was just a pain management thing. Now she wasn't. It wasn't a structure that carried any risk going forward. Um, so she was fine to to do some running. And they just said to her that you're just going to have to be prepared that there's going to be some discomfort in Tokyo. Um, so I was really keen for her to just do something um, just before she left to at least sort of mimic a race in some form, um, so, but do it in a way, set her a session that I think that she would achieve that would at least put her in a positive mindset going into the race. Um, so it, it took a little bit of convincing because um, there was a bit of um, uh, resistance from her family as well. They, they are obviously dealing with her and they knew how down and disappointed she was and they didn't want to risk her missing going on missing the whole olympics but i was also thinking like it'll be a complete disaster if you in the last three weeks have done absolutely zero hard training we need something and i wanted the tokyo experience to be a bit of a positive one for her at least go in feeling like you know you were looking forward to racing so Anyway, um, we decided the day before she was going to leave um, to go out to Homebush. Um, we had the whole track to ourselves. Um, I got one of the boys from the squad to come out and pace her. And we just set up a sort of a mimic sort of um, running, no hurdling or anything like that, um, but just like some a 3K sort of race pace session, but a bit easier, um, just so that I thought she would achieve it. Um, but it would also give us some confidence. And fortunately, it went quite well. Um, she went, she finished it, you know, her foot held up and she was really excited that she had just felt like, okay, I have retained some fitness, you know, just with all the cross training and everything that was going on. So, um, so she got on the plane the next day and she was, she was excited to race, which was the best thing. And, you know, at least, you know, going in the Tokyo experience was going to be somewhat positive up until the race. Um, I guess as a coach from this point of view, um, I didn't travel to Tokyo um, purely. I had a young, got a very young daughter and also, um, there was no guarantees and obviously with the two weeks um, quarantine coming back, having our own business, it was just going to be a bit challenging. In any other normal world, I'd be over there in a heartbeat. Um, it was a bit of relief actually for me just putting her on the plane because it was almost like, all right, Adam, yours to deal with now. <laughs> so, um, but um, look, um, so she went over there excited. Um, the, the medical staff were pretty um, conservative with her over there. Um, one of those injuries that they thought any sort of compressive load, so slow jogging where she was going to be on her heels a lot more was just potentially just going to upset her. So while she was over there, it was really only just two key sessions that she could do. And they were very, you know, easy sessions anyway, just getting ready for the race and not adding too much fatigue. So in the final month, there was very, very little running going in. And I guess my mindset at this point was, you know, oh, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe she's freshened up. Maybe she was just really tired from all of those races that she'd done. And this has given her opportunity to freshen up. And then the other part of me was just really realizing, you know, we've missed so much preparation time. Like, I, I can't see how this is going to be what, what we had envisaged it to be, you know, um, six weeks ago. And look, the, the race didn't go well. Um, you know, she was far from the athlete she was a month prior, um, and it was it was difficult to to watch from home, um, but also difficult not to be there because you know I just really wanted to be over there to I guess give her a big hug and just say you know how proud I was of 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 at least her getting to the start line and you know putting herself on the biggest stage when she knew that she wasn't she wasn't up to her best. Um, 
But um, we had a good conversation post race, and you know she was pretty realistic with it all. You know she was disappointed, but you know she realised you know what she'd overcome to get there, and she'd had her Olympic experience. And I guess the best thing was is that you know all the feedback that I received about her after the race was that you know she was really right up there for all the other athletes that were competing, and you know was involved in all the, the making of the signs and stuff for other for other athletes. And I think that she she handled that disappointment well, and you know and then from what I've heard, was a, a really great teammate going forward, which I think is just a, a great reflection on her personally. Um, so in terms of um, my reflections, I guess for me personally as a coach, it was it was obviously a, a disappointment. I guess um, there are obviously challenges along the way, but I guess as coaches, we, you know, we pride ourselves on having athletes um, prepared um, for the biggest stage of their life and to perform well. Um, and that didn't go, go well here. And... Um, and it's sort of going, I guess, working as to to what would we do differently, and you know, and I think one of the big things, maybe one of my regrets, is you know, probably um, after those those series of races that she had in such close succession, and and sort of realizing that she'd lost a lot of conditioning, maybe just being a little bit happy to just sort of say, okay, let's just have a little bit of downtime to just mentally recover from the stress of those races and physically, because it obviously took a lot out of her. Um, and and maybe just sacrifice four or five days training to just sort of physically recover and, and just feel like she's ready to get back into hard training again, um, as opposed to thinking, well, we've only got four weeks, we've lost some conditioning, maybe we need to get back into things now. Um, um, the other, I guess, thing is um, when we've gone back and we've sat back down since Tokyo and, and gone over things that maybe we can do differently, one of the big things that worked well, seemingly, um, when she had her first season with us where we had no issues is that she was working twice a week um, with supervised strength and conditioning coach. Um, and that had been something that she was still doing strength and conditioning, but it was it was, it was was by herself. Um, it wasn't supervised in the occasional supervised session. Um, so that's something that we've now gone back and, and rectified. So um, she's now working twice a week with someone Look, there's no guarantees, obviously, with anything like this, but um, it's something that we're um, we're hoping will improve her durability a little bit. Um, the other thing we've talked about is um, at um, different points in the year in terms of her preparation, um, looking at um, just doing two as opposed to three sessions a week. Um, she's always been sort of, we've always typically been three sessions a week um, and sort of as a result of her being a little bit of a, a low volume trainer. Um, but um, looking at potentially, I guess, taking that third session out, making it two and trying to gradually, I guess, build up maybe a little bit of volume that wise as a result of a bit of reduced intensity in the program, which will hopefully some more low intensity based training overall improve her durability going forward that allows her to pay, probably train a little bit better. Um, and um, yeah, and I think that's, that's most of um, most of the the reflections. I'm just having a look here to see if I've um, missed anything. But um, yeah, so I guess that's a that's a little bit of um, of Georgie and um, and Tokyo and and how it all went and um, some learnings from it and um, and what we'll do maybe a little bit differently going forward in the future. Um, so it was obviously a really challenging time for us, but um, you know. It, um, it probably brought Georgie and I really closer together. Um, we've got a great relationship now. Um, and I think, you know, um, if we can keep her healthy, um, you know, and get get the advice off other people that have been in those situations, um, it'll um, hold us in good stead going forward. Um, and I think that's the other thing, the reflection is just to understand from the failings, learn your athletes really well, um, learn the event requirements better, and then ultimately just try and produce better and more consistent results at the right time of the season. Ben, that was um, a lot to listen to. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was pretty epic, mate. And uh, and I sort of, I hope that you'd be able to share it as you have um, to, to really do it justice, to know that it was a really tough prep for you. Um, and I hope that uh, yeah. people sort of recognise it doesn't always go smoothly and sometimes as coaches we're fully under the pump um, and it's hard to sort of appreciate what people go through. But um, has anyone got any questions for Ben at this point? 
you did do a pretty good job at answering probably most questions I'd say Ben so well done to you. Anyone want to offer any thoughts or anything like that or either? Well Ben I reckon you've done it oh, here we go there we go Des. Actually no I, yeah. I'm go walking down. still in the supermarket um, <laughs> it's died. Um, I was just really interested in Ben the resilience of Georgia and yourself in dealing with all of the setbacks and and how she dealt with that. Sorry, Di, what was that? Um, just the resi oh, Georgia. Look, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, she's possibly the, um, the most resilient athlete I know. Like, just she um, she obviously gets down, and I probably don't see every emotion because I think you know she's probably ha how she is with the family is probably a little bit different to how she is around me, and she probably you know, exudes a bit more emotion around them, but she just gets on with it. She's, because she's had such a long history of um, niggles and upsets and interrupted preparations, she um, she knows how to cross train and she just gets on with it. And uh, it's almost become just part of the athlete that she is, that she's just so used to doing it. Um, and I know, you know, Dathan's talking next, and I know you probably had to do a lot of that yourself um, in your times with your injuries and stuff is that, you know, athletes just get used to it, and it becomes part of part of what they've got to do to be their best. So, um, and for me personally, look, it, I guess, um, yeah, in terms of the resilience, it was just I was probably inspired by Georgie, really, like to to get to the point where she was, and it just makes you, I guess, want to work hard for your for your athletes when you've got someone that you know is going through so much of that that hard times, but is just really trying to do everything they can in their power to to be the best athlete that they can be, that you're just, um, you want to work just as hard for them. And, Thanks, and I guess just, just to also reinforce the, the point that Ben made in regards to resilience and her ability to bounce back mentally and emotionally. I mean, she was one of the key cheerleaders for the team, you know, after she competed, it was almost a relief. She got to get that experience and get that out of the way, but uh, she definitely added a lot to the team environment. Um, it's just uh, yeah, obviously, a shame she couldn't get the result that she wanted out of the the experience as well. So, you know, I'm sure you guys will keep pressing on and uh, learning from that and 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 taking it forward and um, and hopefully continually chasing a a result that you're going to be really proud of walking away. Yeah, Easy. And add on, Go, just just dig here. Look, Ben, I I I just listen to that with in awe, mate. That uh, what you've done as a coach, you know, and working with the the setbacks. You know, I thought, well, two or three setbacks, then another two or three, then another two or three, and then in hospital. And, you know, I mean, it, it's just incredible. And that's that's what coaching is all about. You've, you've just done a fantastic job to get her there. And, and then to to finish with, you know, um, with, where the race didn't go well and to have her in, in good spirits, it's just a remarkable job you've done. So well done, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Dick. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thanks, guys. Well, look, we will move it along because I'm I'm conscious of time this morning. Thanks a lot for that, Ben. That was fantastic. Dathan, we'll we'll bring you in here. Obviously, Dathan, I've I've got him here, probably more specifically talking about Ollie, but I'm more than happy for you to talk about Morgan as well because we know he sort of came in very late in the in the in the cycle, really. What it was only a, a couple months out from the Olympics, so so a really challenging sort of thing to undertake as a coach uh, in that situation as well. So. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you are well aware of the athletes he coaches. I'm sure you've probably watched Dathan as, a, as an athlete himself. So I'll, I'll throw it to you, mate, and uh, let you have a bit of a chat about uh, about how this experience was for you. And don't worry if you're, if you're struggling for words. I'll, I'll help you find them with a few questions. All right. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, no, I, I uh, appreciate you guys having me and moving it earlier in the morning for you over here. I'll have my, coffee, my afternoon coffee with you guys. They're all up there bright and early. Um, I, I guess starting, uh, for me, I've been, uh, I've been working now with, uh, with Ollie for, oh, I guess it's been a, maybe a little over a year and a half and, um, kind of took him right out of his NCAA college experience. And when we signed him onto our team here, uh, Morgan, I mean, he complete opposite. Yeah. As Adam said, we really, uh, I, I kind of inherited him, I guess, more, more than anything about, um, I guess it was probably a month before the Olympics, maybe. So um, I think, and they had completely opposite buildups, completely opposite, opposite experiences. They're completely opposite athletes. Everything is different about them. And so 
for me, it was a really good learning experience actually, because I had a lot, um, I had a lot of success with Ollie over the last two years. And, um, and also just with the buildup, you know, coming off of it, all those things were very good. Whereas Morgan was, uh, yeah, like there's uh, things for me to learn, but also things that I think he just can change as an athlete as well. And, and that was part of him coming to our, our team last minute. It was a strange experience, but as you know, it just, it happened to be in the world, uh, the way that things are with, uh, shoe companies and things right now, just, it really just kind of was a, a thing that he wanted to do right at that time. And, and so it, you know, I, I took him on and we did the best we could with him, but, um, a little bit more background on Ollie, um, you know, it, it, we signed him in the middle of the rate, right, right when the pandemic basically started. And so he was coming out of college and, um, had been good, but, uh, struggled a little bit in his last two years, actually at college, he was, you know, had a lot of success and then struggled a little bit. And so, when I saw, when our our uh, our team signed him as one of our first athletes, um, he moved to Boulder with the rest of the team, and um, and I we kind of brought a, we have a pretty multi uh, multinational team, um, so we we brought him in with some of our other runners, and it was pretty apparent right away that he was incredibly talented. I mean, I had seen his results already, but also um, he had hadn't been quite as consistent in the in the two years after. Um, you know, after, after he had won the NCAAs. And so, uh, but it was pretty apparent right away that he was someone who was incredibly um, emotional, but like in a good way, like he, he's one of those people that runs very good uh, on emotion. And so not everybody does. Like we have an ongoing joke that if Ali's stressed out, if he's not stressed out, that we need to come up with something for him to stress about so that he runs better. And so right out the gates, uh, you know, it was this pandemic and he wanted to prove himself and, and so he ran very well that first summer. We we were very fortunate here in the U.S. to have some meets going on um, finally, and and so we kind of jumped on that uh, on on the fitness that he had, and he ran 3:34 very early, um, and I think in August of 2020. But it didn't count for the selection because it was the uh, the World Athletics had closed the window. So um, so you know we we did the best we could uh, with that first season. It gave him a lot of confidence to know that you know, the talent, the fitness was there. Uh, but then, um, you know, really we had to turn our eyes to, okay, when things open up, we have to be ready to go. And, uh, at that time, uh, you know, I was learning a little bit more about Ollie and, um, and he, he also had to go back to Australia to, to do his visa because his student visa had, um, had expired. And so he went down and he went through the quarantine and, um, like I said, he's an emotional guy and he was an emotional mess. Um, and most of, you know, any of you guys that came back from, uh, from Tokyo and spent the two weeks in the, um, in the, in the hotel, I mean, I think, uh, it's, it's definitely a test, uh, a test of your mind. And so he came out of that and, um, he had to spend, uh, about two months down there for sure. And, and it became av- apparent very, right away that he, he's an athlete that does not do well without like direct supervision. And he, he really, that emotional part, he could not help himself from, you know, running too hard or uh, not necessarily doing what the workouts were prescribed. And so he wanted to do a couple of races while he was down in, in, um, in Australia. And so I was okay with that, but I also knew that he had just come off in two weeks in the hotel. And, and so uh, when he was going to do the, he decided to do the Albie Thomas mile and, um, you know, Jai, I had kind of known who he was, but you know, he hadn't, he had likewise had been injured, you know, um, for a couple of years. And, and so we knew he was very talented, but he showed up and he beat Ali and Ali was, I think that was on, honestly one of the best things for him. Cause he's like, I got to come back and I got to get in shape. And he's an athlete that does very good at altitude. And so, um, he came back with like uh, the fire was lit for him and we went to a training camp and, um, we got a month here in Boulder and then we were able to go, and, uh, um, and spend some time down at, um, at sea level, but we brought the altitude tent with us cause he does respond very well. And we were able to do a lot of fast training and we knew some of these races were finally starting to open up indoors. And so, um, I knew he was incredibly fit, you know, before he ran 332 indoors, but, um, actually lining up and doing it, you know, and having the race come together is a, is a different story. And so, when he ran, he ran 3:32. I think the first week of February, and um, 
we kind of thought at the time that okay, that's he's probably on the team now. Like that's that's probably what it you know what he needed to do. But then uh, he he was a worrier, <laughs> and so I had to, so he was always worrying about what the other guys were doing. And, um, and so for him, you know, when we sat and we watched the, the national, uh, the national championships go by the trials, um, it, it was not a bad result for us, but also like it gave him, it, it definitely made, made it very clear that there was only one place left. And so, um, we had to make the conscious effort and decision at that time to basically take every opportunity that we had to show his fitness. And so, um, that's something I would actually, I hope to be able to go back and change now a little bit is that, and in this coming year is that he had, we kind of just kept swinging for the fence. And part of that was trying to establish his, um, his credential a little bit more. Um, but I, I would have liked to have had him race a little bit less, I think, um, during that time in April and, and, and May, but, um, but we, we knew that, uh, he did have to have every opportunity since he did use the exemption and didn't come back for the, for the, um, for the trials. And so, uh, so when we got the opportunity to go to Gateshead, we knew that he was going to be racing against Stewie and, and Ramsden and those guys were running very well. And, um, essentially if he was to beat them, it was probably mostly seal the deal we thought, but, um, you know, but it, so it felt to him like the trials. And so, you know, like I said, he, we have to come up with things for him to stress and worry about. And so we basically built that up in his mind. Hey, this is it, you know, like, and he, he does very well under pressure usually. And so, um, so we built that situation up for him and it was a very last minute thing. We didn't know we had been trying to get him confirmed in that race, but we didn't know until about a week before that he was actually going to be confirmed. So we bought flights, went over, I, I got over there with him and, um, he ran great. And, uh, and so at that point, you know, we still had a month left in the selection um, uh, window, but there was really nothing else we could do. So I just said, look, Ali, we can't continue to just swing for the fence. We can't go and do all these other races. We have to start training like you're on the team. And if you're selected, then uh, then great. But there's, there's nothing else we can do right now. So there was a conscious decision to pull him back at that point and something I would have liked to have done earlier, but I think... Uh, you know, like they're given the circumstance we had to do it. And, and so he, he, um, so he ultimately he did go on and, and got selected. And so, um, uh, he was running, you know, he had been running very well, but then we didn't really race much, I guess, uh, consciously going into the, into the Olympics because he had been doing so much. I felt we needed to prepare well for a fast, well, a fast final for sure. And then, the prelim and the semifinal ended up being incredibly fast. And so uh, that's something that surprised me a little bit, how fast the, um, the preliminary rounds were. And, and I think for Ollie, you know, like he, he used a lot of mental energy, I think going through the rounds and he had to, you know, getting into the final was incredibly difficult. And so um, unfortunately, yeah, I think he, uh, he was pretty much, I think, mentally toast by the time the actual final rolled around. Um, he, he ran very well through both prelims, but it was kind of a, it was a dog fight to get in there. And so, uh, I, I prepared his, you know, his mind, you know, and to go out fast, but I think all uh, like the heavy, heavy racing schedule earlier in the season, I think, um, it was a little de- detrimental, uh, to go through three rounds like that. And, he just, he definitely looked flat and tired and, uh, in the final and, and he was disappointed for sure because he felt he went in going and thinking that he could win a medal and run under three thirty And, um, and so for him, he, he was disappointed with it. And it was the one time that after he was pretty happy with most of the races leading up to that, but afterwards, you know, he was very emotional and he couldn't believe that his worst race of the season he felt was at the final, which, you know, he, he was he, he ran in one of the best finals ever, but it's still in his mind he he wanted to do more and and so I felt like um, I felt like we could have if we if if the schedule was different we could have prepared him better but also we had we did what we had to do and um, and so the one thing going out of it he did come out of it still raced well the rest of the season but he wasn't pleased with his performances all the time either and so I think he's mentally gotten to the point where he wants more, but, um, 
by the end of the year, yeah, it was like he had just had such an amazing year that we had to pull back. We had to reflect on the things that we wanted to change and that I hope to be able to, to do better with him. Um, but for him, he, um, he took those things to heart, but the, um, but he already, he trained so well, honestly, it was almost the opposite of what Ben was talking about. I mean, Ali was just consistent across the board. Like he didn't miss things. And, um, he, he, I always would have to hold him back. And, uh, and that is really like the thing that I walked away with at the end of the year, the most important thing was consistency, uh, because all my athletes that were in the Olympics and other, for other countries, my Americans, my Polish girl, um, and even the ones that ran well at the end of the year that didn't make the Olympics, all my athletes just, it's consistency is everything. And, um, and so for, uh, for Ollie, he didn't need to be more consistent, but he also needed to realize like all the little things that make a difference. I think like I told him, you don't need to train harder. You already train hard. He runs 95 miles a week. And, um, it's, I mean, he, he, he very does everything when you practice very well. But all the little things, he doesn't like to stretch. He doesn't like to, he doesn't like the time in the gym. He doesn't eat well. And all those things, I was like, you just live better and you will continue to get better, you know? And so for him, he has started to adopt that a little bit. And, um, and so I know the things, I think after spending so much time with him, what helped him to tick, but also, you know, like finally breaking through to him on some of those things. And I think, you know, like he, he believes in himself now, uh, but he still always feels the need to prove himself. I think a little bit. Um, I think living away from Australia, sometimes he feels he feels that need, and so like I think that that's something that you know, like the psychological part is so important. As Ben was saying, you know, like you're going in and um, you know mentally, if if things are going well, it's always easy. But like when things pop up, when um, when there's difficulty, that's the stuff that rattles you, and um, and so like you know, going, going forward, I think, um, yeah, like I, I think I'd like to spend a little bit more time on the mental part, like for sure. I, I spent a lot of time with them, but like getting to the race, I think, um, I think that mentally being prepared for, um, you know, like the all in one effort, I think was more important, you know, like, uh, I don't think what we, what Ollie did throughout the year you can't do that every year for 12 years either you can't just you know like you can't just swing for the fence over and over and over again and and you know I, part of that will be probably um improving his other distances 5k and 800 i would like to see those you know on him have opportunities to not have to always think about running this fast 15s you know over and over and over again like that becomes monotonous and that becomes uh, you don't get the same satisfaction. I started to see it at the end of the year after the Olympics and he would go to the diamond league races and, you know, every 1500 is just another 1500 and another 1500. And if he didn't PR or, you know, like that wasn't a, it wasn't a success. And so I think if we can craft his season a little bit better um, and, you know, part of that is the circumstance of COVID and we, you have to be, be creative in the situations that you have and, he was lucky to have opportunities to run fast, but also I really believe that you have to be all in on, on the big, that big goal of the year. And so um, I think he took a little bit of money out of the bank every time he really went for it. And so um, I, I'm going to try to hopefully pull that back a little bit for him this year and try to get him to focus more on a few really big efforts. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, get better at some of the other disciplines and, his training is going great. He's picked up right where he was left off before. And, and so um, if he can be consistent, get better at the little things and then just be able to focus more, um, you know, on, on the big, on those big, big goal moments, I think that he can continue to build off the success that he had this year going into Tokyo. And, and then Morgan, I mean, yeah, Morgan was the opposite. I mean, he was pretty broken down when we got him. He started, he walked to the start line with some, some other issues started popping up and he was like, he was, he was cooked, but you know, like a couple months beforehand and we were just getting them there. And I didn't have the relationship with Morgan that I had with Ollie or like Ben had talked about, if you had spend all that time with an athlete over and over again, you get to know them very well. And I was just kind of coming into that, you know, uh, situation. And so um, we've been much slower with Morgan now coming out of that. His, his training is actually going very good again, but 
been very slow. Um, and knowing he's incredibly talented and very focused and an opposite personality uh, of Ali, we've taken a very different approach. And um, he's, it's just going to, it takes, it's taking more time. And I'm also not rushing anything with him because he did have a couple injuries that were pretty severe. And so now he's, he's up to close to normal training, I guess. And that's a good sign. And, but he's, he can handle it. He's very, you know, like he, his personality type can handle that. And so, but I can say, I mean, I don't think Morgan's never trained hard <laughs> for a, one week. I don't think in other than the, the week, uh, one of the first weeks we were together, you know, like he just, he doesn't train that hard and it's, I mean, he's that talented, but like he, um, you know, I think, I think he just needed a good environment. And so like, that's one of the things we're trying to provide for him, a stable environment. He floated after college for a couple of years and, um, you just can't do that because, uh, as, as you guys know, if you come from a very a supported, these guys, if they come out of the NCAAs, they come from a very supported, um, uh, environment. And then they're just kind of let, if you're just left to, to your own devices, you will do things wrong. And that's just part of, um, part of being young and, and, uh, emotional about your training. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we provide that for him now. And, and that stability, I think has been good because he's been able to, you know, even like coming up this year, like we're not rushing things for him and it's a real, there's a very long-term approach and, um, and if it means he sacrifices in the short term, then that's okay. Um, and so I think we, we just have to, um, I, I try to, everybody is different. So some of my athletes can train a lot, some of them can't and knowing that individual approach. And, uh, I think that that's something that's, that's pretty important for, for them and, uh, working with, uh, working with the the therapist and the strength coach and giving those them all the other things that maybe I'm not an expert in. Um, I think that's that's been pretty important. I mean, most of our team was very healthy this year, and and a lot I think a lot of that is just an individualized approach with some other people who are very smart uh, that that can can help them and help me be able to give them you know better training as well. And so I lean heavily on those people. I think and. Um, and there's been a lot of progress for, for both of our athletes, uh, that, that, uh, are Australian guys. And it was, it was fun in Tokyo. It was good. It was good to be able to, uh, I, I was able to go, um, on a USATF, uh, credential with a couple of my athletes that made it, uh, but got to spend some time with Adam and talk to Dick and some other people that are, are a support crew for your guys' uh, for you guys national team. And it was very, uh, it was very good to see me see for me to see how you guys operate and, it was very well supported, I thought, for the athletes um, for a smaller federation. They did an amazing job. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to throw a question to you. Uh, just obviously, we're we're looking today as uh, coaches who who were on debut and, and some and for both Ben and yourself, it's actually the first uh, Olympics that you were a coach at. H how was the difference of being an athlete to the coach? Did you sort of uh, were there certain things that you picked up on? you know, quite differently. Obviously, uh, yeah, the environment's quite different for a coach to an athlete. But, uh, you know, are there a few things that sort of clicked in, uh, you know, from now being in that coach's seat? I th the big thing was feeling somewhat helpless at times. <laughs> Honestly, like, as an athlete, when I when I did my Olympic, my three Olympic teams, um, I got better at each one just because I got older. Um, so I was able to, to handle those things. But um, I always felt like I could do something and part of it was the situation I think with COVID I was able to see my U.S. runners every day um, and so I, I was able to go to the U.S. training center and and um, so that was actually really easy for me um, it was actually kind of hard I think uh, for for them and for me uh, to to be able to not see each other the not knowing uh, part because um, it was such a big experience and then and we were very close and so I think um, I think not having that, that maybe stable, you know, connection was hard. And so, um, I knew nothing would change in the training. Like the training didn't really matter at that point in the last week. It wasn't, nothing was going to change. It was really more their mental state. And, and I do put a lot of stock in that. I think it's, it's really important. And so as a coach, you know, like if I had the opportunity to see them, I was going to see them. It didn't matter if it was for 10 minutes and my one Polish runner, I couldn't, I didn't have any, uh, credentials to see her. So, like I got to see her like three, you know, two or three times for like 10 minutes at the practice track. And if that was it, that was, I felt like I was at least doing something. Whereas 
I mean, nothing else I was doing was mattering. So it was really just, I mean, it was being there to support them. And so, um, you know, for, you know, for the boys, we had, we had talked about a lot of these things and uh, beforehand, but not being able to kind of like have like a normal practice every day that I think that that was an obstacle for sure. And, um, and, you know, like if it's like that going forward in, in different circumstances, then I probably just had to prepare them, you know, like for that. And that's part of, I think being on your first major international team, like for Ali, it was his first major international team. And so uh, I, I don't think that he was maybe as prepared for that. You know, he wanted to believe that he was very self-sufficient, but in reality, you know, he hadn't been in those circumstances before. He didn't know the, a lot of the medical staff, things like that. And so, um, whereas I think Morgan felt very comfortable. He had been in the, you know, multiple world championship teams and, and so like he, he kind of got it a little bit more. And so, um, I think every athlete's a little bit different, but preparing them, you know, in advance, knowing that however the situation is going to be is important. And so, um, I was fortunate with my U S runners to see them every day for two weeks while I was there. But honestly, uh, I think, you know, they, I was not that I was doing anything for them other than providing, you know, that, that it's like emotional support at that point, really, like they would have done the workouts, they would have been fine. But I, I do know like that, that, that part can't be discounted either. And so hopefully the world normalizes and things get a little bit easier going forward on, on uh, future teams. But, um, you know, as his first year pros, that's, that's a tough thing too. I mean, for Ollie, I think, you know, he, he came straight from the NCAA really. And so like, he, he just, it was really a first year pro. And so, um, there's just, it's just such a big stage. And I think as an athlete myself, um, I think I had a lot of opportunities to get better at that, but yeah, the first one I, I dropped out of my first Olympics myself, you know, it was, my first one was the worst one, you know, and then I got more comfortable each world championship or Olympic team I made. And, and I hope the boys will do the same. I hope that they'll, you know, they went through the first one. You gain a lot of experience about just the situation, but also what to expect. I mean, knowing that, you know, like in the 1500, it's going to be a dogfight every year. Like it's not going to get worse. I mean, these guys are going to be, you, we have to anticipate that it's going to be that good every time. And so I think going forward and preparing for that and knowing that you don't even have to do anything different, just having like, you can't buy experience they say. And that's, I think having that first one is so important. So whether it's a different, if I was to say another athlete, you know, if it's a junior team, that's important. I mean, whatever you can do to, to look at the broader, you know, picture that that's going to build you to the next level. And it doesn't necessarily have to step out and be the Olympics the first time there's ways to do that. And, you know, like you guys do probably, uh, probably a very good job at that, um, identifying the younger runners and putting them on those teams and stuff. And like in the U S there's such a big talent pool that, some of these kids, they come out of school and they never went through any of those, um, you know, younger junior uh, championships and things like that. And I think that it can be a big shock to athletes. And I know it was for me. I, I had a, a couple of little springboards, but I did struggle the first major senior uh, championships that I did as an athlete myself. And, and then I only got better from there. Uh, that's great. And Justin, you got a question? Yeah, Dayton, you said that um, you thought Ollie over-raced, but he only really did six races, including the indoor race. So do you mean over-raced in terms of intensity or just the number of races? Yeah, I think I think the emphasis more, like not necessarily the number of times, but that every race felt like it was the trials to him. You know, like he, he put so much into, he ran 333 a couple of times or he just went out and 151 by himself and just, you know, like, and I think, I think every race, it was like he, by the time he got to the Olympics, he had basically run those six races and then the, the two rounds. And it was like, he'd just been, he'd just been swinging and swinging and swinging. And then he just kind of used, used up everything he had to get there. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think that he didn't, I don't think he raced too many times, but definitely too much emphasis on like, this is the most important race in the world. <laughs> that's what, that's probably, whereas I would have loved to have had him just try to get a PR on the 800 or, you know, let's go and run a 5k and just see where your strength is at and things like that, where he can walk away and say, all right, well, that was different. It, it wasn't a 332, 1500. And I didn't, but that it still served a really good purpose. And I, I learned the skills of racing without the expectation of having to be like the best race I've ever run. Cool. Any other questions, guys? 
take it, advantage of the opportunity while we've got Dathan here. It, uh, Adam, just uh, it, Dathan, <laughs> how are you going? <laughs> Doing good, Dathan. Well. Um, I, um, it, it's amazing to me, you know, the, the relationship the coaches get with their athletes. You know, I, I didn't know Ollie. I, I met him briefly, you know, at the Albie Thomas with his dad and so on and before he went back over to you. And um, I could have sworn talking to Ollie, you know, right before his race, you know, not right before, but within an hour, um, how relaxed he was, you know, <laughs> how, how, how different opinion you can get when you don't really know the guy that you know him and how, how you felt that that was one of his, uh, one of the things you really had to work on. And um, I, I just, I found it quite remarkable that, that I, I remember thinking, by oh, gee, that guy is so relaxed and, and how's he doing that? That's just terrific. Um, and I, I saw, you know, your relationship with him and, and, and even over there, I, I sort of appreciated how lucky we were to have coaches like you looking after us, Australian athletes. And how now, and the way you're talking today about uh, about Ollie's long-term plans and and running for Australia, running in Olympics, running in World Championships, Commonwealth Games, whatever it happens to be, I mean that's just fantastic. You know? So it's uh, it's been music to my ears. But the other question is. Um, with those races, you say there was the mental stress between the preliminaries and the final, and he wasn't right. What about the physical stress, though? Did you, did you feel that he, he he suffered, you know, more than others from one race to the other to come back because it was quick early on? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Dick. The first part, yeah, like it was very good to be able to talk to you, like someone who's been there forever, as as some of these younger <laughs> coaches I think on there know. Um, and yeah, Ali was a the kind of yeah, he's a very good liar you know like he he looks like he's he looks like he's relaxed and chill but in reality yeah he's a bundle of stress and um i think going in you know like knowing that is probably just yeah like i guess i spend so much time with these guys here because yeah they're their dads like they, they're young men you know and so like their dads are back there they're close to their families and i'm like their american dad i guess you know for them because they they just have to rely on that and but I do think you get a really good appreciation for where they are mentally. If you, the more spend time you can spend with them, the better. I mean, some people have full time jobs. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to do this, you know, and spend that time. And because it, it really does create like, uh, I think, like also a trust for them to come to you um, at any time. Like because some of these mental things are hard to talk about, honestly, like the mental part is so like they don't want to admit that, you know, like the the doubts, the the things that they feel that's the stuff they don't want to admit they want to they want to hold that out and put that public persona like wow i'm a relaxed guy this doesn't bother me yeah no big deal but the reality is no matter who that athlete is whether they um georgie has been through so much to get there i mean she's hiding that stuff i mean ben knows that you know like there's stuff that she's hiding you know like and there's stuff that she'll share with him but i think we know the more you spend time with those athletes like they're they have they're all in on these things and that means so much to them and I think as an athlete, you know, knowing that and then I think just the more time you can spend with them, the better because it does help that. Um, and then, yeah, I think they slowly they they trust you enough to be able to then let the emotions out and you know like that that's important. So, and then physically, yeah, like I, I do think that there's uh, I think you guys did a very good job of um, we, we would get them on the table right away. Um, we have someone look over, like Ali hates, he thinks if you see the physio, that means you're going to be injured the rest of your life. Like that's not like in his mind, that's, you can't, that's, he doesn't understand like pro proactive, you know, like <laughs> prehab is something that he would never consider. So like, so I think, you know, we were, you were good though. Like you say, all right, I got to get in there because I only got one day in between all these things, throw them in the ice bath. We would throw the cooling vest on them right away, get some food in them. Um, but I do think, yeah, like he, he ended up pulling two very, um, very difficult, uh, you know, um, sections, but they, it's always going to be like that. It's always going to be good. I mean, some people look at it and, you know, one of the races, what was it? I can't remember what the, one of the, one of the prelims was unreal, like 331, I think. So like he wasn't in that one, so it could have been worse, I guess. But, um, I think it's super important to have the right therapist there. And I mean, that's something I think in the future, like we weren't really able to do that with COVID, but. Um, I have someone that works on them all the time. And if it makes, even if it's just like, a, like if they feel good because they're there, because they see that person often, I think that's important. And so, 
Um, but going forward, yeah, I mean, he's got to be, we just have to consider we're going to be prepared to go out hard in these kind of races. Like it's going to be, these are going to be sub 330, 1500 finals, you know, from now on. Like, and if we're prepared for that, we know it's going to take a toll. And um, luckily, Ali, he tra- handles training really good, the load already. So like I say, if he can be better at the other things and have a long career um, and continue to stack one year on the next, I mean, consistency is everything. And if he can do that, then I think he'll be, I think it'll actually be, uh, he'll, it'll be an advantage for him if he can do those things, just because he has been able to handle a lot of training as well. Very good. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate that. I'm going to throw it over to Julian uh, now, if you don't mind. Uh, just again, conscious of time, people might have to actually get to work. So, um, Julian, if uh, if you wouldn't mind, do you need me to share the uh, the presentation that you did? Um, or, or would you like to uh, take control of that from your end? Um, I'm, not, I'm not very good at this stuff, so I'm not sure how All to right. do that. Um, do you, is it can, so you can do it and just click the click the button yeah you just click the one with the uh, arrow pointing up and it should give you an option of what you want to share um all right and thank ah, you Dave, okay. by the way sorry to cut so quickly i'm just <laughs> trying to uh keep everyone on time if i can i can't see it so how about you do it if that's cool all right i think yep easy Gee, your calendar looks pretty empty yet, Adam. <laughs> I'm not even sharing anything right now. <laughs> How is that even getting shared? <laughs> I haven't selected anything. I need to talk to AA and give you some more work. Uh, okay. Yeah, hang on. I should be able to get there. You're on. Yeah. This one here, I reckon. I can start talking anyway, just um, yeah, go for it. before it pulls up. So um oh well here here you go basically uh, yeah i got a spreadsheet because um because i'm not as good at talking as you other blokes so uh ali um was the athlete i coached for her debut marathon in um tokyo sapporo uh ali um just a background on ali she she is a physiotherapist so during the the lead up um probably to about 12 weeks before the race she was still working part-time um she's an online running coach so she has sort of 20 25 athletes she coaches um she lives down in areas inlet with joe so her, her husband um and trains with the surf coast track club which is an amateur group where um she is the star and what that allows is a few of the the male athletes to train with her so she has training partners um, a few times a week which is good um Next slide is just a video. Just I took, I thought I'd chuck it in there because I think it's amazing. Um, Adam, can you just can you control it, mate? I don't think I can. Um, uh, and so yeah, this is just an, 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 a little bit of a clip from where we we run. Um, this is a good morning anyway. Uh, yeah, this is more Sorry, difficult. Mate, I don't think I've got the option to actually play it. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's just take it across, just clip by clip. That's it's all good. Yeah. Um, so basically, Ali was a, a junior athlete. Um, she did do little athletics in her hometown, but and then fell away to team sport. Like a lot of regional cities in um, in Australia, we we tend to sort of prioritise like the, the team life, like the towns built around the local sports club. So for her, it was netball. So she started playing netball at a pretty high level. Um, then she moved down to Geelong and, and she first followed a training program in 2016. So that was Melbourne where, uh, she ran 246 and, um, that I, I sort of helped her with that training. Basically she was just doing what I was doing and she progressed in, in three years to run 226 at the Nagoya marathon, uh, which was the qualifying time she, she achieved for the Olympics. And then later that year, ran 31.18 to finish 13th in the 10,000 metres at Doha, which was quite a shock because um, she never considers herself a, a faster runner or a track athlete. Um, that has her fourth all-time Australian. Uh, and it was um, it was off a good training block in St. Moritz when she trained with uh, like Sinead Diver and Camille Bascom. Susan Crummins was there. So she learned a little bit about being more of a professional athlete 
and she'd lived with them earlier in the year at Flagstaff. And so, yeah, there was 2019 was a year where she really grew up, matured as a, an athlete and, and changed her, her mindset from being something that she was good at to something that um, she did for a living. So uh, she went on to run 227 in, in New York, uh, which was a pretty good race. But I think that the highlight of the year is the 31-18. Um, the next, the, the, the build we went into sort of after 2020, she actually had a pretty terrible 2020 with injuries. Um, so the delay of the Olympics was a, a blessing in disguise for her. So she, we came into, into 2021. Um, she was healthy, so she was running about 130k a week. The way that we um, structure our training is, is two workouts a week, with the third workout pretty much being a, a harder long run over the hills of uh, Anglesey, like areas in like the surf coast, where in two hours she'll climb about 500 meters or so, and and the tempo's on for her because she's running with with a guys group. Uh, so one. VO2 workout normally on the track. Occasionally it'll be hill repeats, one threshold tempo. Uh, once a month she'll do a long tempo, like marathon pace, 10 miles or something. And a lot of yo yo type um, lactate shuttling threshold stuff. So up to 40 minutes to 60 minutes of just going over and under the threshold. And we try to get her racing, which is always difficult on the track. It's a, it's a battle to to get her to run on the track and she had some she had some pretty awful races honestly um the first half of the year i don't think she broke 16 minutes for 5k which is crazy considering she she's run 31 18. um but we got to hobart half marathon which was sort of the end of that first block and and she ran pretty well but uh nothing nothing that suggested that she was super fit or or at a, at a point where she was fitter than she was in the past um, but that kind of changed as, as we went into May and we, we entered that marathon specific block, uh, Ali, she went to, we, we moved up to Noosa, um, Ali and I, and Joe and Bree, my wife, we sort of lived together up there for about 10 weeks, um, and it allowed us to, to get out of Victoria and, and her to be a full-time athlete again, which helps her specifically in recovery she doesn't do a lot more training but she just feels better with her when she runs because she's actually not working during the day so we upped the mileage we allowed um, the mileage to increase and this was pretty easy she, she doubled six times a week but that's not too difficult when you're not doing anything else during the day and and she's pretty resilient by this stage of the year so she got up to 170k maybe a couple of weeks um, because we were more flexible, we're outside the training group, we could work on a different cycle. So we were about 14 day cycles, but we were trying to be flexible with that and just adjust to how she was feeling each day. Um, there were no real plans. We didn't have training partners, so we could wake up and, and kind of do what we wanted, where we wanted. So we would we kept a VO2 workout in. This would sort of maybe 400s, 1K reps, uh, higher volume session. Um, threshold we would, would do sort of fartlicks or um, just pure sort of about 20 to 30 minute thresholds um, and we did three marathon specific workouts in those two weeks mostly which um, we included long runs sometimes it was longer tempos but most of the time it was some sort of twist on a long run workout um, and yeah she she had different training locations during this phase so she went to Cairns for 10 days for the um for the AA sort of camp up there like test the conditions try a bit of nutrition stuff a little bit of cooling work and then the new sir and then back to Cairns for three weeks and then Sapporo for one week uh the, the major variable that we sort of looked at in Tokyo was the heat so obviously looked around it looked like it was going to be quite warm like the predicted was sort of mid 20s decent humidity and in actual fact it was sort of more like 28 um, with 75 percent humidity at the finish line so it was hot and and we had a bit of a, a theme going that the hotter the better for Ali because we felt like she was prepared better than maybe a lot of the other athletes would be 
um, and her race plan was based around it being hot at the end and so getting hotter throughout the race. So we did um, heat acclimation training, um, a mix of passive and active heat stress. I was I, I ran at Doha Marathon, um, not 2019 World Champ, so I'd actually gone through a, a pretty good heat training block. So I, I had a little bit of knowledge and experience with that. We have a guy, Sam Tebeck, Adam knows him, who's done a PhD in heat stress and in heat acclimation work. So we had him help assist us with this. It involved a um, lot of time in the sauna, um, running, rubbed up, baths, hot baths after some of her runs. Um, and we, yeah, like we had to manage that with the, the stress of higher mileage and um, obviously some of those harder workouts. But I felt like we got it right. Like this this was Sam who helped us with this. Uh, and, and yeah, the, that's probably the biggest risk is that you don't get the – you don't get that overcooked feel like in the first week or so, but if you do three to four weeks of this stuff, then all of a sudden you're in a hole and you've gone too far. And I remember talking to Mona who had that issue before one of his major championships. Um, I know Lee Troop cooked it in one of his and uh, like we were really careful to try not to, to do that because we wanted to be on the start line healthy. Uh, we trialed pre-cooling in the lead up. Um, this was good, especially at the Cairns camp where we had um, Jess, the nutritionist, Collis, Tim O'Shaughnessy, everyone was sort of helping out there. We, there was a real emphasis. I felt, I felt like maybe an overemphasis from the team on, on the hyperhydration strategies, like maybe a little bit, um, I'd say, we, we backed off the hyperhydration that was suggested because it was playing with the gut and um, it was recommended that we keep trialling throughout the build-up right up to sort of three weeks before. But I wanted um, I wanted those last three weeks just to be full of confidence to not have to to not have to make decisions there. I want all the decisions to be made a bit earlier. So we 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 found a hyperhydration strategy that involved no gliss, glycerol um, and just pure sodium in a smaller dose than than what was was trialed uh, that seemed to work really well it sat in the gut well um ali was confident which was the main thing like she was she was anxious actually about that and about um about having things recommended that weren't working for her i think that's something like that i felt as well at doha is is like it's, it's better for the athlete to be confident in what they're doing than to get those tiny little half percenters absolutely perfect. So um, we took that into our own hands a little bit. The, the ice bath, ice fest slushy combinations before the race worked really well. And I think Cairns was a perfect opportunity to, to practice that. And just how Ali felt in the, in the first sort of 15, 20 minutes of her workouts up there um, gave her a lot of confidence that, that all the right steps were being taken. And then, yeah, mid-race cooling. So trying to get as much fluid in as possible, which mechanically is quite difficult when you're racing as fast as, as those girls were. Um, and even running with, like, you see the walk. A lot of the, a lot of the protocol in Australia has been done on walkers, like a lot of the research and recommendations. And it's, it's a very different um, movement pattern to running. And so all the frozen towels and everything, they don't quite work as well when we're running. Um, so we it, ice water over the head seemed to be the the preference um and then just maximizing how much fluid was taken because you'll never get enough as much as you need in conditions like that so finding a way that we could get as much as we could um, the other variable in tokyo that we found was going to be the pacing so uh we watched a lot of um we watched a lot of uh like Oh, this is just the um, yeah photos of what was going on. Um, we watched a lot of previous championships that all that have been held in the heat, just to see how the races played out, um, who did well, who made right decisions, and 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 just I guess being being a little bit more of a uh, a, a nerd about racing and and more knowledge, and um, I think that helps just to sort of see how this the race plays out, and having watched them before play out like that is. You can sort of draw on those what you know of what's happened in the past and yeah the we didn't really know how fit ali was like we had training 
we had training sessions, but because the races in Australia were all canned, we um, we didn't really know how fit she was. So that was always that was going to be a bit of a um, uh, an unknown on the start line. Uh, we didn't know how the races would play out. I, I kind of had a feeling that because all the the road races had been cancelled, um, a lot of the athletes in the field wouldn't have raced for quite a long time, and so there would maybe be a little bit more adrenaline on the start line. Um, maybe they went out a little harder than they probably planned. Maybe they've lost the feel of racing, so the pacing might have been more erratic. So our, our goal or our theme throughout the build-up was to, to, to simulate the race strategy and the race plan that we wanted, which was um, to be really disciplined early. There was a few workouts that Ali had that didn't go well because she didn't quite respect the heat and she, she probably watch gazed a little much trying to hit paces, even when the temperature was in the mid twenties. And um, that was really helpful in the long run because she uh, she started to respect the, the effects that the heat would have. Um, and then it taught her to be more disciplined early in the race and to be more patient, especially when you come off the pre-cooling, you feel amazing, like you don't feel hot. You feel like you've, you've sort of in this magic zone. So she was quite, um, so that that really helped. We we did a lot of progression runs where we would do sort of a two and a half to three hour run that just sort of increased pace along the way. Um, throughout the throughout the the run, we would sort of focus on certain cues, um, and the cues would would be like at certain points in the race what what Ali would focus on and um, help to get through those patches and and sort of have a theme for every every period of the race. And yeah, we we. We, we changed the prescription as she got the cans from from doing workouts from pace based prescription to feel feel based. So, like we would do, we we might do some progression runs where I wanted the start of the run to feel like it would be the start of the marathon. So I didn't want to hit say marathon effort like how it would be at 30k straight off the bat. I wanted to, her to recognise the different feels of the marathon, um, and and yeah, just understanding that. Marathon effort at 35k is very different to what it feels like at 5k. So, just prescribing marathon effort randomly, is, um, I don't think it's that accurate or helpful. I think we need to sort of give the, the sort of feels that that she's likely to experience at different parts and have her practice those. Get more in tune with that. Um, uh, so the the splits are on the side actually that she ran. So she went. So she sort she executed this to perfection i was really proud with with how she did it um i was a little worried that she'd get caught up in the the racing and the adrenaline but the race played out perfectly for her because it started slowly and crept up so she was um she could tack onto the back of the front group get that little adrenaline out for the first 5k and then sort of uh sort of zone into her own feels and and she did that so just the progression from from being 76 at the 5k mark halfway 54th and then to finish in 23rd was exactly what we wanted, how, the, how we wanted the race to go. Um, she negative split by something like 15 seconds. So we feel like the pacing was perfect. Uh, she was, she's always been worried that negative split, she leaves um, effort and leaves time out on the, on the course, which uh, we had to mentally get her over that feel of, of um, feeling like she's not actually putting 100% in by being disciplined early and having her enjoy the second half of a marathon and just the adrenaline boost you get from feeling good when others are feeling bad and just um, hunting down the field, it's 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 invaluable. And um, she, she experienced that in this race and she finished saying that's like, I just love racing like that. It's so much better than getting to 30K and dying a slow death. So I feel like we we did um, we did execute the strategy we wanted and and yeah I was really proud of her for for how she did that um, because I knew it took a lot of like self control. Uh, we actually have a funny dynamic, um, Ali and I, because we were quite good friends before we started even really running properly together, um, and and that's that's changed how we relate how i like we have a different relationship to to how i have relationships with with my other athletes because we're close friends um we were colleagues we actually have a business together now and we train together most days 
So we are really in each other's pockets all the time. Um, and I can understand that could be a, a problem for, for some sort of personalities, but we, we get on quite well. And we, like my wife's friends with, um, at like best friends with Ali and, and I really like, uh, me and Joe's hang out, go surfing together all the time. So we have a good relationship and uh, I, I find like that's a little probably different than say if you take an athlete on later in life, it's you, you, you don't get sort of the, the 10 years of, of knowing the person before you start coaching them and helping with their running. So like I know, I, I've known her dreams about running in the, the Olympics, especially in the marathon for a long time. So there's a, there's a big investment for me there, like a big emotional investment. Um, uh, and yeah, because we're an amateur group, we, we, we don't really train with the group that often. So it's sort of a lot of me and her time. Uh, I get to sort of be in person. I've, I've never really done that with her until the last sort of 12 months, just because we've lived in different cities recently. And I just, um, like, I, I, I didn't understand how much more helpful it was to be in person as a coach and to, to see the workouts go down and to be watching. Uh, so watching the workout towards the end, I mean, you can you can see a, a workout on paper and you can hear feedback from the athlete um, by correspondence, but it's nothing to seeing how the athlete looks in those last stages of the, the long run or the workout where you get a real um, insight into how comfortable they are. So I found that was was um, really helpful and and I would do it again if there's a big race coming out, we would spend some time together like that. Uh, there's days where you can recognize like more subtle mood changes with, with the athlete just because you know them as a person. And there was a few times where I could see her getting anxious. So we, we changed a few things and it, um, just, I guess, listen to her a little more because she's quite smart. She's really mature as a person. Um, she doesn't have that obsessive, well, she's starting to get it more recently, but that obsessive distance running personality, um, it's been one of her strengths that she hasn't really uh, had to deal with that. Um, but yeah, it is coming in more, more lately. I guess some of the, the fallbacks uh, is that we, like, as with spending a lot of time with anybody, we sort of can irritate each other, especially when we're friends, not just coach athlete. Like we'll feel like maybe the coach athlete, the, the conversations and that stay a little more sort of running based. But when we have disagreements on other stuff, like we can start to, to irritate each other more than more than a coach athlete would. Um, I felt like sometimes she can manipulate like the plans a little um, when I feel strongly about something just because we're a bit closer. She, she knows my cues to, to, to get me to change stuff. Um, and yeah, I guess there was a fear that maybe like if something went wrong or or pear shaped in our relation in our running coach relationship that would impact our friendship, uh, which was always there niggling away like at me because I didn't want to lose her as a friend and like we're quite close with obviously down the coast we spent a lot of time together so um, that didn't happen so all good. <laughs> uh, the, the challenges for a debut coach, so for me, like, uh, there, was, there was a lot more pressure on this. And I've never really had pressure because I've always just helped Ali um, and she's just progressed naturally and she's never really put a lot of pressure on herself. But the Olympic thing did change things. And immediately I was like, okay, this is really important now. Um, do I, firstly, like, do I know what I'm doing? So that imposter syndrome, like, I, I absolutely felt that, especially early on, especially being removed from other training groups. We're in our own little bubble. Um, and I look outwards and I was like, shit, what is everyone else like starting to do? Like these guys are, are racing more or they're, they're doing three workouts a week um, or they're, they're going to altitude, this kind of stuff. And, and so it, it, I found myself starting to really sweat little tiny things like trying to manipulate all the small details of every workout and um, like found myself going, oh, should you run 6K or 7K for the double today? And I would like spend 20 minutes like debating with myself whether that's the right thing. And that's that's one thing that like I didn't like about 
sort of how I became as a coach because it wasn't the sort of system or the it wasn't the relationship we had to get her here in the first place. Um, it was a lot more informal and relaxed, uh, and that did change a little bit. I f we f we felt like we were searching for the perfect build all the time as well, which um, there is no perfect build. We all know that. But when you're trying to sort of when you look at a training program and you try to manipulate everything to be perfect, uh, that's something I've, I've never really done before, and it's something the Olympics definitely influenced, um, just because of the importance and significance. I was like fretting over small stuff, and yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great. And it's, I guess a learning experience for a coach you probably wouldn't do that in the future as much. Uh, and I like I was there to help Ali as much as I could. So for me, like my job. I've found myself taking all the stress away from her in terms of planning workouts, <clears throat> finding the spots where we would do them, getting her there, um, sorting out the drinks for her, uh, finding training partners. So I would try to take every sort of mental stress that I could away from her, but that was potentially overbearing, I think, for her because she she's not the kind of athlete who needs that. Like those sort of things don't really stress her mentally. She's fine with that, whereas they stress me mentally. Um, so I, I reckon I probably got a bit overbearing with that stuff for her. Uh, and, and again, in the future, would, would just sort of be a little bit more casual and relaxed about it. Um, when she went to the pre-camp in Cairns after I spent sort of 14, 16 weeks with her pretty much full time, I did. I found it hard to to sort of send her off knowing that there was still time where things could go wrong. Um, and again, this is sort of some insecurities, I guess, as a coach to not be there and not be able to change things and guide things as much. Um, so yeah, when she went to Cairns, I'm like, I don't, I, like everyone's got their own philosophies and like, I, afterwards, like now, in retrospect, everyone was doing everything possible for her and just being there for her. Whereas when when um, when she took off, I'm like, oh, oh like they're going to run in the heat too much, or they're going to run easy runs too fast. And and I was I was just sort of not a lot, not really trusting of of her joining other environments like that and being manipulated by um, other athletes or or other philosophies. So that was something. Um, that within sort of a week or so had definitely receded and, and I fully like trusted everyone after that. But at the time, I wanted to still have that control. And again, for me, probably just a little overbearing. But uh, I think a mature athlete, it's a lot easier to let that happen. I reckon if, if Ali was sort of 22, 23 and, and had left and she's easily sort of influenced, then it would be a lot more tougher as a, as a coach. So probably just some of the takeaways, I guess, for me um, as a coach from the from the experience. Um, some of the workouts that went poorly early on were were actually really beneficial. So the the perfect build, like it's it's not a real thing. Um, her, Ali especially, we had a workout that went poorly probably twelve weeks out. And on my part, I'd, I'd scheduled it probably a little bit too difficult. She wasn't ready for it yet in her build. And towards the end, it got really tough and, and like her paces got slower and she started to struggle. And uh, it was great. I think it was great for her because she sort of realized that um, there are some weaknesses like in her her end game towards the end of a hard workout or a, or a, a long race. And so she, she it sort of forced her to accept that. And we, we, we were able to work on those things, um, certain certain mental strategies for her to get through if things don't go perfect. And it, 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 so it's, for me, I like I think the way that she negative split the marathon was a great example of how how she grew as an athlete um, and and taught her to be a bit more resilient. Uh, champions don't chase. This is just a, a it's something that me and my mates talk about. It's it's doing things our own way. So there's so many different philosophies out there. Uh, there's so many different training groups that do different things and we see success in multiple ways. And um, I really believe in just believing and investing in, in what works for you and your own philosophy. It's, it must be really difficult for someone who chops and changes between um, training groups and different methods of training and structures. So 
uh, like we we made a plan just to stick to exactly what we believe in because it's what got Ali to where she is and um, and and it, it takes the heat off trying to search for other other sort of special ways to train and, and um, yeah so doing it doing it our own way was really important to me and trusting the athlete that's something that sort of I learned from all this is it's really I guess important to to trust the athlete that you're working with, um, having them buy into your system or buy into the philosophy and the plan. And then throughout the training program, sort of tutoring them a little bit on why we're doing things and having them understand why we're doing things at the different times. It allows them to make decisions uh, like throughout a training session or a training week or even during a race um, that fit with our plan and it means that sort of I can sort of let them go and trust them a lot more to, to make those decisions. Um, and we actually had a few sessions where it allowed, like there was opportunities for Ali to, to sort of make her own decisions throughout the workout. When either it went poorly, I just stood back and sort of said, um, and sort of let her go and just decide, sort of gave her the opportunity to to make decisions and and, um, work out herself the strategy for getting through so basically allowing her to work through it herself and um, if there's always someone there in their ear telling them what to do or giving them advice cues then they're never going to really grow so um, I found that was really important and that's something I'll, I'll do in the future as well so yeah um, she came 23rd and um, that was a great result top 20 was her goal but um, yeah I think 23rd is, is pretty incredible. She went in ranked maybe 50th or 60th. So any time you're sort of outperforming your rankings, a good day. Julian, thank you very much for that. I um, I really enjoyed that. And I, and I, I sort of saw uh, on the screen many many smiles when, when we sort of, I think it was this one here, and looking at those challenges for the debut coach and people sitting there going, yeah, I reckon I'll, I'll recognise some of those areas and uh, and I think that was a really good share there. So I really appreciate that. Has anyone got any questions for Julian um, before we wrap up for the morning? It's not a, not a question, not a question, Julian, but, you know, again, listening to you as a coach, it's, um, it's pretty refreshing, really, uh, to, to hear we've got people uh, talented coaches around Australia that I've heard a couple this morning and, and you know, clearly clearly our international coach but um, uh, to me it's um, the, the thought that you put into it and, and, the, and the care that you put in with your athletes uh, it's it, it's absolutely required and there's no question that the athletes uh, wouldn't do it without the support and the coaching from the mental side and the, and the physical side that you guys have both that I've listened to, all the three of you, all put in with the athletes. That's just terrific, and it's one of the reasons I think that Australia's, you know, had a had a real boost in in, in uh, middle distance running, uh, marathon running. Um, I mean, it's terrific. We're we're basically on the world scene now, which mm -hmm. is which is which is it, it's 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 shared around, and we've got lots of talent coming through from. Um, from the coaching side and, and 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 now i see that you know with athletes australia with the mentoring program and and sharing ideas like you three guys have done this morning you share ideas and 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 the key issue that that i thought came out of julian is that that he works from first principles and he and, and this, what, that's what he was really saying that he, he works with the way that he wants to work not just to follow what other people are doing and that's understanding what you're doing. You're doing it because of something. And then he also said, well, sometimes I explain why I do that, you know, to Ellie. Uh, and that's important too, because it gives the athlete that real confidence that the coaches uh, really knows what's going on and, and, and got a program developed specifically for that athlete. Now, I've really enjoyed this morning, Adam. It's been terrific. Uh, so thanks for putting it on. Thank you. And, and, and very much thanks to the guys for sharing so openly. Uh, I think you, you only get a lot out of these things if people are prepared to share the uh, the, the 
you know, the, the tough moments as well. I think that was why I wanted to put on a debut coach as one, um, because it's never easy getting an athlete uh, to the start line or on a team or, or to perform when they get there. And and I think we've heard all of that this morning. And and it's uh, and I think sometimes we, we focus and we've talked a lot about the athletes this morning, but I think the coaches have all done a great job of sharing how it actually impacted them and some of the challenges they went through. Um, and and I, I, I really thank you guys for doing that because uh, um, until you've gone through it, you, you probably don't quite recognise what it what it's going to take from you as a coach um, to go through a, an Olympic preparation. And, and and I know that once you've sort of done it a few times, sometimes you almost take it for granted until you look back on on the, those those early days and and realise how much you've learnt and grown along that pathway. And I, my hope is that uh, coaches in Australia will will continue to help each other and share and support each other and recognise everyone's given it a, a red hot crack and 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 trying their best and giving everything they've got to it. Um, and and I think it's great if we can come together and support each other like we have been. So I appreciate everyone's time this morning. Um, I appreciate uh, appreciate definitely the sharing of the coach this morning and those who have asked some questions and provide some observations and hope to hope to be able to continue doing this style of thing in the future um, and keep connecting coaches. We will have a Athlete Connect session coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm just finalising the athletes going into that one. So if you've got any athletes in your squads or anything like that, I'll, I'll forward out the link to everyone on this list and, and all athletes who are TTP athletes around the country will get invited to that. And that'll be a similar sharing of, of athletes. I think we've got about six athletes at the moment who are who have agreed to do that. And, and we're looking for a couple more, just waiting for the school holidays to start, which will probably be the primary sort of age group of, of the athletes who, who were targeting for that presentation. So uh, probably about two weeks away just before Christmas, uh, we'll get that going and keep them out of their parents' hair for a few hours. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate okay. your time. I'll yeah, stop recording thank you. now. And uh, yeah, catch you all soon. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Adam. Cheers, Adam. Cheers, yeah, yeah. All, the, all the best, Dathan. Yeah, catch you later. See you guys.